I'm excited to have Radhika on. Radhika is a good friend of mine. Uh, she was one of uh, my first authors I ever got to work with uh, at StuCant. And she is the, the author of our consumer behavior textbook here at StuCant. I'm going to read a, a quick bio about her and the impressive things that she's done in her life. She is a businesswoman and a powerhouse. I, I had the opportunity to go visit her in New York and was blown away. It's a, a different world comparatively to rural Idaho. So <laughs> I was a, a good experience for me. So Radhika, she draws on her experience of working with highly regulated industries like financial services and healthcare to lead the design and innovation brand strategies and to drive awareness and considerations for brands through multi-channel marketing campaigns. She is currently the head of marketing at, and student financial inclusion at Chase. Uh, she earned her MBA at the Marketing Columbia Business School and a bachelor's degree at the International Business of Leonard and Stern School of Business at New York University. She also teaches consumer behavior at Leonard and Stern School of Business at New York University. I had the opportunity a year back to go and sit in on her class, and uh, she's a, a stellar professor that really bridges the gap between academia and industry. So we're in for a treat today to hear from her and to, to glean from her experience. Uh, having one foot in the in big industry and also a foot uh, in the classroom and, and being able to help her students, uh, you know, provide real valuable skills in the workplace. So without further introduction, I'll turn the time over to you, Radhika. Thank you. And everyone, thank you so much for giving an hour of your time today. I'm really excited to get to chat with you. Kelton, by the way, I'm convinced. So I grew up in a town of 1,100 people. I don't know if I told you this. Um, and then I came to New York for college. And um, basically, I've spent my whole career here. I'm convinced that everyone can live in either setting. So one day we'll get to have that conversation. And um, the last thing I'll say before I dive in is the the respect is is mutual. Kelson is it was amazing to work with when I launched my textbook, and still to this day, I'm sure he does not appreciate this as much as I appreciate him. I still continually harass him, like I need help with this, that, or the other, and he's always there and always amazing. So thank you in advance. I had to turn off my camera. I'm blushing too hard. But I, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Got to got to start the the Monday morning with with happy thoughts. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, spend about 45 minutes, call it 40 minutes now with me. I'm so excited to join you to talk a little bit about why I think it's just so incredibly important to be teaching both with really clear consumer behavior theory but then also um, practical real world applications of that theory. And um, I'm, what I'm very much excited to do is walk you through how I do that in the classroom, but also um, have this be very much an interactive discussion. So look, I have only been teaching since 2013. Um, you guys collectively and individually have a ton more experience at this than I do. One of the things I love about meeting other professors is that they teach me how to be a teacher. So I'm eager to share what I know. I would love for this to be an interactive discussion because I suspect I will take away more from this than, than you guys might in the next 45 minutes. So that's the goal. Please stop me um, as I talk because otherwise we'll, it'll just be me talking at you and we all know from class that that's not exciting for anybody. All right, so let's keep going. And apologies, I don't know, I have a, um, I have a one-year-old daughter, so if you can hear her yelling or screaming or doing happy things in the background, you'll, you'll know why. So this is, this is me much more dressed up pre-COVID. Um, I, as Kelson mentioned, I, I work as the, the CMO of the Community and Business Development Team at Chase. And I'll explain all of what that means because uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful. But I thought what I would do is just spend a minute walking through my career path because um, I think one thing that I, I have the opportunity to bring to the classroom is all of those years of experience working in marketing. And I find that that's one of the things that my students seem to take away from uh, the experience. So I spent six years of my career as a management consultant, consultant, oh, can't speak, at Deloitte Consulting, where I focused mostly on marketing and brand strategy projects. I then went to one of my clients, which was Pfizer at the time, and I had the pleasure of running two ADHD brand teams. So these were uh, this was again in marketing, uh, kind of like owning the PL for two medications that helped to treat ADHD patients. Uh, I then went to a company called Common Bond, which is a startup. So I went from big, massive companies, Deloitte and Pfizer, to Common Bond, which when I joined it was 20 people. It was an amazing change. 
Um, and my role was to run the marketing team. So we focused on how do you how do you get customers to pick our product? Common Bond was a student lender and is a student lender. So acquisition marketing was incredibly important. Brand marketing was incredibly important. Nobody knew about this 20 person company. So how do we make sure people know about the company? Um, thirdly, market research. And lastly, sales enablement. And now currently I work as the CMO of the community and business development team at Chase. And um, here my role is to market products and financial help for three segments of customers. Number one, underbanked customers who are customers like my parents might have been who emigrated to the US and they didn't have any credit and geez, it took them two years to get a bank account. Number two, um, students. So again, keeping the connection to just my love for school and students alive. And then number three, mass customers. And during that time, I have been teaching. So I started teaching at Baruch College in 2013 and was there from 2013 to 2016. And then went to Yeshiva University from 2016 to 2018 and have been at NYU primarily in the Stern School of Business, but also in the Tandon Engineering School from 2017 till now. That's a lot of it. So that's my career path. I get the pleasure of bringing that into the classroom. And um, what I find is that that's, that practical application of the consumer behavior theory that I use every day at work, I get to talk about how I do that in class. And that's actually what I want to talk a little bit about today, because I find that when students give me feedback, they tell me there's lots of there's lots of constructive feedback, as we all I'm sure get from our students. But that's the one consistent positive piece of feedback I get. Um, so I thought I'd share a little bit of how I do that. And please, please stop me um, anytime again, because otherwise I'm just talking at you. Sound good? I can't see any nodding heads, so I'm going to assume it's good unless someone stops me. Okay. So um, maybe before we go into the learning objectives, I just wanna share a little bit about why I teach. Um, for me, I found undergraduate to be such a foundational couple of years for my career success, primarily because I had professors who took the time to make this active effort to marry theory with uh, practical application. So I graduated undergrad and went into a management consulting job and I felt actually quite qualified for the job. So I didn't feel differently from some of my friends, like lifelong friends that were in my analyst start class. I felt like I got there and knew how to at least do something to be valuable to the team. And a lot of my friends actually said like, no, I didn't feel that way. And the number one reason I felt I had that benefit is because I had professors who made an active effort to say, oh, here's the theory. And let's like do a couple of exercises to think about how you would apply that theory to everyday life. So that's that's really why I've chosen this, this topic. And our goal for today is to look at why the combination of theory and practical application is so important, and then talk through how we could incorporate it into our actual classroom experiences. Sound good? Okay, so it's really interesting. I am in the good fortune, I have the good fortune to hire um, a number of people and have had that good fortune over the last several years. And the number one thing that the entry level, whether out of undergrad or out of business school or graduate school of some kind, the number one thing that folks say to me, whether they are, um, they were at the time, my direct reports or over time, they become skip level conversations is, I don't feel prepared because I didn't learn this in school. And for some folks, they're marketing majors. Like they would, what we, what I do every day is literally what I learned in school. I use theory. So I, I always question the why. Like, why don't you feel like you learned how to do this in school? Like that's what school, school is for a lot of things, but in my opinion, like one of the things school is for is preparing you for your job. And, and they say like, we just didn't tackle questions like this or problems like this. And I want us to be able to, to solve that so that when a team member joins, whatever their job is day one, they feel like they can pull from the notes and from what they did in school and hit the job run, hit the ground running, which is exactly how I felt. So look, okay, that's a lot of introduction. I feel very strongly that for marketing students in particular, and for myself, theory and practical application of that theory are two sides of the same point. You need them both. Um, and I, I actually think 
it's really, really important to have them both. So look, when it comes to kind of theory and practical application of the theory, there's a couple of different types of knowledge that you need to acquire. Number one, um, you need the theory. And I think it's because theory teaches students the why. It helps them understand why one technique or one framework works over another and why others fail. In, in a lot of ways, it helps you build context for a problem. It helps you think through the whole situation as opposed to narrowly jumping to tactics. And when it comes to marketing, that's actually a challenge. I feel, again, in my, in my professional job, I think those that don't have the theory background, they jump to one narrow sliver of the problem instead of taking a step back and thinking of the theory as a whole as a way to frame their thinking. It also teaches you through the experience of others. And, and not for nothing, I don't think we should all, we should all have to make all of these mistakes ourselves. The practical application helps you acquire, in my opinion, the specific needs or the specific tools that you need to be successful in your job. It sits much closer to your day-to-day -day work, but in my mind, it is literally just the flip side of the theory. It is applying it to what a marketer or what a student is going to do every day. And both of these things are just really important. I feel very strongly, um, the team members on my team and myself included, none of us would survive without the ability to do both. And, and again, therefore, I want us to have the opportunity to teach both those skills in a university setting. So interestingly, um, because I'm a consumer behavior nerd, um, to think about this in terms of consumer behavior, we think about how do students learn? Well, when you're learning a particularly difficult task, right? It's not, it's not um, behavioral learning, for example, you're, you really use cognitive theory to learn, to process information. And what drives cognitive learning? Well, it's the four things that you see on the page, familiarity, relevance, interest, and the ability to process. And I'm sorry, there's an ambulance going by. We'll let it go. Perfect. You need these four elements in order to, um, to actually process and learn. And I just wanna go through each of them. And I'm so sorry, I think there's maybe another ambulance. Okay, it's going away. Um, apologies for that. So the benefit of working at home in New York um, and living on the second floor. So look, all if, if we if students need all four of these things to really process information and really learn it, then you think about why practical application is important. Well, familiarity is a no-brainer. The more familiar the student is with the topic, the more likely they are to remember it. So if I show Maslow's hierarchy of needs and it's like a one and done, that doesn't drive familiarity. If I show Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then I continually show how it connects to other real world business problems, that's actually going to drive familiarity. So that's kind of thing number one. And I, fire truck? Okay, I hope everyone's okay. Um, in my class, what I do to drive familiarity is I take a consumer behavior principle and then I have the class apply it through really five different ways, particularly for the most important frameworks. First, we talk through it, then we have Q&A. So that's way number one. Then we do a case study. Then we do a Wall Street Journal article. And what that means is uh, the Wall Street Journal has a student subscription. And before every semester, I essentially pick out one article to emphasize each of the consumer behavior principles that we're trying to emphasize. And we have a discussion about it. Then we do a simulation and we'll talk more about simulation. And then we have a guest that emphasizes that theory. And the guest typically works in a totally different industry than I do with the goal of making sure that they bring a different perspective. But for every theory that we think is really important, that by the way, I actually use these theories in my day job, we bring it home and hammer home familiarity through five different ways. So the second is relevance, second and third are relevance and interest. These are fairly self-explanatory, but the way I try to handle them in class is by trying to make the theory both relevant and interesting. Sometimes the practical application actually helps you for helps you to do that. So for example, I found that, and, and this is a no-brainer, right? I'm sure everybody does this. I found that the Q&A asking the class to apply a framework to their own lives, right? Where they've interested, where they found 
you know, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like where have they seen that? Where have they seen their needs change? The pandemic has been a great example of that. And another, another way that has worked is also to use that Wall Street Journal article. So a great example of this, um, in this past week in my class, we studied a Wall Street Journal article about how NASCAR was trying to appeal to younger, more socially conscious consumers. And we use the tri-component model of attitude formation and change um, to discuss and really compare and contrast how NASCAR was doing, what was going well, and what could they do better, how they could use the tri-component model of attitude and behavior change to actually change attitudes towards NASCAR. And then we compared and contrasted that to what Formula One has done and how they've actually done that quite a bit better. And so look, not every single person in my class was interested in car racing, but at least it helped to bring to life, number one, a problem a company is facing today. And number two, I gotta say, I think people are probably more interested in car racing than like in my actual job. So I, that's a little bit of how we help. We try to drive relevance and interest. And then the last one on the page here is ability to process. I actually think that, so um, last summer, I had the opportunity to work with the student team to develop a simulation. And I think that the stimulation, it's now live and my class was used, has used it every, every semester that it's been live. And what they say is, this helps me really think through how to apply the theory and practice it and make real world marketing decisions in a way that's safe. So I, I think that that's actually been quite valuable. So if we think about how do students learn, they learn these complex things through cognitive learning. Cognitive learning is driven by these factors. And I think there really is a way to make sure that by the combination of showing the theory and then applying it to real life, we are actually able to drive familiarity, relevance, interest, and, and really hammer home the ability to process. I'm gonna pause. I feel like I have talked for 18 minutes straight. That's a lot. Questions, thoughts? Does anyone else do anything differently or more interestingly that I could learn from? One thing I'm, I realized when I went and visited your class in person is, is how do you, how do you, you find those relevant examples that do interest your students? And then what is your thought process there? Do you just try to identify um, like what's currently happening? What's the biggest buzzwords right now? Or, or do you just kind of feel it out by your class's interest? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, it's really interesting. Um, in a perfect world, I'd be able to say, oh, I just use my work, but I work at J.P. Morgan Chase, and before that, I worked at Pfizer, and I had no ability to actually bring my day-to-day -day work in the classroom because it would be a legal and compliance nightmare. So instead, what I do is I actually spend quite a lot of time reading. So this, this NASCAR versus Formula One thing, I am neither a NASCAR or a Formula One fan, but I just read about it. And I, I, I tend to do a couple of things. I read, first of all, a lot of just like general newspapery type publication. So my go-tos are the Wall Street Journal, the FT, and the New York Times. I find that from this combination, particularly my, my stern students tend to be global in nature, um, you, you kind of can get what's going on in the world that's interesting across all of these different dimensions. The Wall Street Journal in particular, you can sign up for a marketing roundup that essentially is a list of articles they send you every Friday morning. And it literally lists a bunch of uh, articles that are relevant to marketing that were published that past week. And if you wanted to have a discussion about it, classroom discussion questions for each. I don't always really use the classroom discussion questions because they're not tailored to consumer behavior, but it does help to cut through the clutter and really help you understand very quickly, hey, like what are the four to five most interesting marketing things that have gone on in the industry this week? And, and I find that that's actually quite helpful. And then the other thing is I am a, I'm an avid consumer of financial services or fintech newsletters. Though I am an avid consumer, I do try not to make my students be avid consumers because like, like car racing is always going to be more interesting than payments. Um, but some of that does, some of that industry knowledge, particularly like new things like cryptocurrency and things like that are the students have shown interest in. But I think that the general, you know, what's going on in the consumer focused industry is always more interesting. 
That's fantastic. The, I'm just reading the comments here and it looks like uh, there's some cool uh, project ideas that other teachers have implemented. Um, James Simmons, I, I don't know if you're open to the idea, um, but if you'd like to, if you would like to expound on how you do um, that that research, we have a, a few teachers in the, the comments. I'd like to understand a little bit more about that. Okay, you're putting me on the spot here, Kelly. <laughs> But, but but I'll do my best. Yeah, I have, um, because it's a 400 level class at uh, Washington State University where I teach, they should, most students should have some sort of marketing research uh, uh, background or uh, have taken a class. So one of the things I've had them do in the past is a customer journey map. Usually it's around a product or product category that most college students are familiar with, like laptop computers, um, backpacks, uh, uh, buying out of home coffee, whatever. But uh, I'll have them do a combination, primarily emphasis on qualitative research, but some quantitative. And they will um, uh, observe and uh, walk through the, ex the buying experience himself. And usually um, most of these, um, topics, I ask them to have some sort of online as well as offline component. So like if it's a laptop computer, it might involve what's actually happening online in terms of the search and information gathering process combined with being in store and uh, maybe interacting with a salesperson, et cetera, et cetera. So again, they're getting kind of the, the full gamut of um, uh, a, a fully immersive experience. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Robert, and, uh, yeah. And then again, obviously, they comment on all the various stimulus that is impacting decision making and uh, determining also what are some of the most important uh, influences in terms of how uh, consumers are making decisions on their particular product category purchase and the brands that they're choosing. I think that's, that's actually really interesting. I love this idea. I also love um, so looking at the chat as well. Um, and I don't know if you guys can see that I'm looking at the chat, it's covering the slide. So apologies if that's the case, but um, Terena, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, I, your idea as well as Jason's idea of getting real businesses involved, I think is very cool. Do either of you want to share that? And then I can share how I, I did that with a startup marketing class I used to teach. But I'd love to hear from you guys first. Again, selfishly, I want to learn from others. Hi, it's Tarina here. Sorry, it's 3.23 a.m. for me. I'm in oh. Australia. Um, so pretty much like I, I love what you were saying about your five strategies. And to me, guest speakers are a big part of that as well. Um, because I do still work a little in marketing, but because it's so broad, you can't know everything. Whereas if you get guest speakers in, they're living it and doing it every day. And it like I learn so much myself, let alone for the students. Um, but very early on, like I really love experiential learning. And I think there's no better way than to sort of get that, you know, the basic theory down and go through the sort of things you're you're talking about but to then give them real experiences because the flip side of this is they want to go out and try and get a job and it's a way to build their portfolio so I really I concentrate on that really hard and most students will know biz, small businesses or um, some of them are working and they can apply it they can really apply it very meaningfully and we have such good uh, feedback from the businesses that are helped from the students that get to do it that the learning becomes very deep uh, for them so uh, and it's it's not really too hard to manage I mean once you break down to the tutorial level where it, your uh, tutor ends up to be more like a coach I suppose and uh, yeah so really that's how, how I do it um I reach out to business networks as well so often they have a whole bunch of businesses on their books and I'll just say, hey, look, do any of these businesses need a bit of marketing help? And all these hands go up and I put it up in front of the students. They pick the business they want as well. So, yeah, I find, I find that that's, that's been 
like the feedback from students on that has been exceptional. So I just keep doing that. <laughs> I, I love that idea. And I, um, I taught a startup marketing class during my time at Yeshiva. So like four semesters of it over the two years. And we did exactly what you're, you're talking about, Tarina. So one option is one of the things we did was one semester we said, okay, there's a bunch of businesses. Students choose a business you like. The, another, the flip side or another way of doing that is we, um, we chose one business for three of the semesters. We found this worked better. And we said, okay, this entrepreneur, she was the owner of a Pilates studio. This entrepreneur is going to come in to select classes. She's going to tell us about her business. And then the classes at Yeshiva were rather small. I had about 20 students. And so we would break the students into teams of four or five and say, okay, this group is going to do event marketing for Annie's business. This group is going to do email marketing. This group is going to do social media marketing. And I think there was one more and I, PR was the last one. And they actually did it, meaning she was a sole proprietor. So she actually like let them do the marketing. And I know it wasn't perfect, but she essentially got arms and legs from students who were eager and willing and excited to help. And they literally marketed her business. And she wound up with I think, a 22% lift in her client base that semester because of the work they did. So I love the idea. I think that there's, there's lots of different ways to do that. And then the last thing in the chat before I move to the next section is from Nancy, who I think is super smart, was, is saying, hey, I show CEO interviews from CNBC. Um, and uh, COVID and gaming is my favorite. And Nancy listed out a couple of examples. COVID and gaming is my favorite because I think, the, I think the GameStop phenomenon is just like a crazy example of consumer behavior. Um, that's really, really important. Um, all right, I am going to go through and, and really like you guys have kind of done this instead of me, which I think is, is actually pretty great. So um, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'll move up to the next slide which talks a little bit about other ways we can bridge that gap, some of which we've already covered, so we'll skip them, but some of which we haven't. Um, the first in my mind is like, is again, like really hammering home how to make some of this stuff relatable. As I was trying to figure out how to teach consumer behavior, which is a very theory heavy discipline, particularly 2013, 2014, 2015, I was just starting out and I had no, no teaching, no training in teaching. Um, the single biggest piece of feedback I used to get is like, I don't get it. This doesn't you know, this, this, these frameworks, they don't relate, they don't enable me to relate to my real life. Um, and so really trying to make the theory relatable is the number one thing I was trying to hammer home, particularly during that time. Um, and I actually think the, the Stukent text does a nice job of doing that and with the goal of really updating that frequently, choosing examples that are businesses that the students either like or can relate to, um, and then throwing it back to the students actually quite frequently with every framework. Again, how do you apply this? So in my class last weekend, this, this semester I'm teaching a Saturday class, we talked about the McDonald's BTS campaign. So for those that don't know, which might be nobody, um, BTS is a K-pop group and they have done a partnership with McDonald's and it's all about, um, it's like new sauces for chicken nuggets, it's like not even a new product or anything. But it's a huge campaign. And we talked a little bit about how word of mouth and reference groups really have an impact, um, particularly through influencer marketing today. And this was the example that we spoke about. So really trying to make it relatable. Like everyone's walked by a McDonald's and seen, um, seen this ad. So I think, I think that's really, really helpful. And it's been really, really helpful to me. Apologies, I keep, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Um, the second thing is, I think, aligning with their future workplace. So like some of us have the opportunity to work in those workplaces, others don't. I, I gotta say like nobody, none of my students wanna work at a bank. So basically I don't work anywhere where they wanna work. And so I, I try to spend a lot of time staying current and really understanding what is it that students want in their, in their job and how do I help prepare them for that? So I do a couple of things to do that. Um, number one, I follow a couple of executives on LinkedIn in industries that aren't my own. Um, because again, like nobody wants to work at a bank, but everyone wants to work at, I'm, I'm making this up, like a consumer products company. And I try to vary this with size of company as well. I'm finding, and it's, it's a different trend. 2013, everyone wanted to work at a big company. Over time, my students are bifurcating. Some want to work in big, in big traditional, like CPG. A lot want to work in big tech. 
and the number one work in smaller startup companies. So just reading what these CEOs are publishing. The second is Ad Week and Ad Age I still really like, and I think they, they write up really interesting campaigns that are grounded in consumer behavior. And then the last is just talking to industry professionals. So I take one 30 minute time period every week to have some sort of call with anyone who works in an industry that's not mine to talk to them about what are they looking for in their entry-level marketers. I think that's just really important because if I don't know what these guys are looking for when they hire, I really will struggle to help teach my students what they need to be successful in the workplace. Um, I also ask friends who are hiring entry-level employees to make a short video, sometimes like a, a one to two minute video about what they are looking for. So I've done this with a number of folks who have been on my teams in the past and have gone on to other industries. So uh, a colleague who runs Oscar for business marketing has said, okay, I'll spend a minute. I'll make a, I'll make a face, like a, a video very like, casually on my iPhone. And I post those throughout our chats and our discussions in our learning management system. And I find that that also helps some of the, um, the students just hear firsthand from the source, from the hiring manager, hey, here's what we're looking for. It also helps me say, okay, how do I teach for that skill? And the last is using teaching tools. So we've talked a little bit about this. Um, so, sorry, I've like totally skipped some of the slides. Um, but in terms of the teaching, school, teaching tools, we've talked a little bit about the simulation we developed. Um, for consumer behavior, part of what prompted us to develop this, quite frankly, is I was trying to find a simulation for my class as we were in the pandemic and couldn't find one that was of a relatable topic. The best I could find for consumer behavior was what was a great simulation, but it was focused on medical devices. And I, I, I teach both undergrad and, and MBAs, and I knew my undergrad students just, the product was so archaic, like it just, it wouldn't have resonated. So what we now do is we use the simulation we've developed. Um, first, we do a lecture with the theory that we're trying to illustrate. Then we do the simulation. And then we have discussion templates for while the students are doing simulation and they do it in groups, they do it in breakout rooms, um, much like this. Then they fill out pieces of a discussion template and we come back and we have the conversation. And if uh, Kelton, I don't know if the discussion templates are available, but I'm happy to send what I use to anybody who would want them. Yeah, we'll include it in the in the post recording for sure. Cool. Um, I, I find them to be, I find the combination of lecture, try out what you've learned, and then document what you've learned to be quite valuable as a way to reinforce the theory and make sure people are making decisions based on it. We've talked a little bit about case studies and guests already. I really like the use of case studies. I find that it's another way of bringing into the classroom relevant problems in industries. So this semester we're doing, we just did Apple last week. Um, and it was why the Apple retail stores were created. And what we came, the conclusion we came to as a class was like, hey, the problem that these things are meant to solve doesn't exist anymore. What should these Apple retail stores be in the future? We started the class with Taco Bell's breakfast opportunity and they launched the breakfast opportunity in like 2014 or 2015. Um, and we talked a little bit about like why, right? Oh, um, by the way, against all odds, Taco Bell's was, success was successful. Um, and then we did another case on influencer marketing. So I typically do three to five a semester, depending on, on, the, on the folks in the class, but also depending on the length of the semester. And the last is guests. We've all talked about how great um, guests are. And Jim, just to reiterate, because I know you'd asked in the, um, in the chat. So Taco Bell, the breakfast opportunity, it's a little bit older. Apple Retail, I believe is what it's called. Also a little older, it's 2006. Um, I use a Chase Sapphire case study because I didn't work on it, but I think it's a really cool example of how you can drive consumer behavior and make a shift in consumer behavior. Uh, and then I use the Kobe influencer case study. So these are, these are four. Um, all right. So this is a little bit about the benefit of the, of the simulation got a great online interface. We have actually also a syllabus that enables you to build a class around it. I do this particularly for my shorter classes and then we'll send out the, the discussion questions. And then last, um, I, 
I, again, like would just love to hear from you guys outside of what we've talked about. Is there anything else that folks want to share for how they do this? So I've talked a lot about like staying current and cases and simulations and guests, but are there other items? There was actually a, a really interesting question I think we could uh, address here. Um, teachers were just wondering about uh, how do you how do you grade equally when you you have those collaborative product or projects and how do you make sure that each student is kind of pulling their weight in in those projects that you outline? Yeah, I, I'd say two things. So number one, I actually don't grade the simulation. Um, I don't grade the simulation, and it is literally like an activity that we do, and it's not graded. And part of it is for the reason you you were getting to, it's like very difficult to grade from that. But um, more importantly, I think of the simulation as literally a, a safe space and a way to practice. And I, I think the students need that repetition and it's like, okay, if they do it wrong, but the richness is in trying and then in discussion we have afterwards. So I don't, I don't grade that. What I do do is we do do other group activities. And the way I grade is based on a couple of things. Number one, the output or the product that the group creates. I do try to emphasize at the beginning, middle and end of many of the classes that, hey, look, like nothing I do at work is an individual activity. Everything is a team sport. And I am graded, which is, you know, you're graded by career progression. You're graded by the ratings you get. I'm graded for better or worse on the team's performance. So this in class is a good way to start to realize that. And what I realize in a work setting is, there are some places where I excel, so I pick up more of the slack there. There are some things I don't excel. So I, I literally proactively go to a team member and say like, I don't have this, do you have this? And I think there's something about framing group projects as a way to prep for the real world. That's really important because like right or wrong, that is how the world works. And then secondly, because it isn't the real world um, yet, meaning it, it is still a classroom. I have each of the students fill out a, uh, uh, like a, a group evaluation and I read every single comment in every one of those group evaluations because what they do is they grade their peers and that is worth 10 points of their final grade and oftentimes 10 points is actually a big amount and that could be the swing between an A and a B because uh, it's actually like a large a large point value and, and students know that up front what I find what I found when I started instituting that grading form is actually um People know that it's coming. So they there tend to be far fewer bad apples, for lack of a better way of putting it. Awesome. Uh, just some other uh, comments I could see. Uh, when you were talking specifically about your case studies, uh, there was just some clarification. Are those Harvard case studies that you're, you're pulling from? Yes. OK, perfect. We haven't written any Kelton. We, we, we haven't written any that I've used yet. We're going to do it. Yeah, awesome. And and you're you're a fantastic author. One thing that uh, Erotica's book does have, if, if you're interested in checking it out for your consumer behavior courses, uh, we did a, a series here at Sucant called Video Case Studies, uh, where we went and found a bunch of local businesses. Um, and it, it was just, it's an interesting approach to the video case concept, uh, as I'm sure many of you on the call today can agree, is it's tough to make students read. Uh, so we have to make it as digestible as possible. So that video case format, uh, they're just like quick five minute videos uh, that have a case study associated with it. And that's just part of the curriculum. One example that always stands out to me since I'm an, an Idaho guy now is uh, we did uh, an interview with a potato company here in Idaho and talked about cross-cultural variations and how, how do they market Idaho potatoes to the world? How, how effective is that brand outside the U.S.? So uh, definitely a resource for you guys to go check out. Uh, Wilcox Fresh, we got someone that's a, that's a fan of that case study. So that's awesome. I also used the video case studies. Last semester, I taught intro to marketing in the engineering school and used the video case studies in the intro to marketing book. And I got to say, the volume of positive feedback I received because someone said like, hey, you only asked me to watch a video and it was five minutes. And it was really interesting and easy to digest. I got a lot of positive feedback on that. So kudos to the team uh, that developed those. Fantastic. If there are other questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, I think that we've addressed everything thus far. Uh, so yeah, if you have more to say, Radhika, go ahead with that. 
No, that that's really that's the end. I'm I'm very interested in hearing from from others if they have other thoughts outside of what we've already discussed. But I've actually I've learned a ton um, from this conversation and have really loved the ideas of using small businesses who we know could benefit from consulting, continuing to to use the video case studies. Um, I also very much. Uh, liked the idea of developing using the quantitative research to develop the customer journey map. So I now have a lot of fodder for for my next semester to think through how will I augment and update my syllabus to make sure that I'm doing the best job I can to include practical applications of consumer behavior. Awesome. John, you had a comment. Yeah, uh, just just a couple of things, housekeeping things, real quick. The slides will be sent out afterwards with the recording. Um, the video case studies are US based right now, Tarina. Um, in our advertising textbook, they, it is international uh, and our authors work in Australia. So they throw in a lot of Australian examples. So I wanted to put that little tidbit in there for you. Um, but yes, John does have a comment. Uh, would we like to turn the time over to him to, to talk real quick? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Hi, uh, just real quick. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing all that great information. I just wanted to kind of uh, piggy bank, uh, or, or piggy bank, uh, uh, piggy back on one of your comments about making it relatable. Um, what I found uh, with my students is if you can relate to the world, it's so important. And when I took my first undergrad marketing course many years ago, they talked about widgets, which was so unrelatable. So you know, you really have to, you know, get into their world and, and make it relatable. And another comment, I love your idea of having guest speakers, and that's something that I've incorporated too, especially someone who is, is uh, you know, relatively young, they can see what a career in marketing really is like, and it really kind of ties everything together for them, and uh, it worked out really well having that in my classes. Yeah, I, I really, really would second that, John, particularly about making things relatable. Like, that's actually one of the reasons I had the opportunity to partner with Stukin on the text You'll see as you, if you use the text, we we use company, we talk about companies that like exist today that students care about. And we talk about campaigns that are fun and interesting. And we talk about TikTok influencers. I, I had the same kind of a bit of the same challenge. I used to feel a bit like, well, the materials that existed prior to that were about widgets and nobody cares. But like, I care about Charlie D'Amelia and how she became the influencer for Step and she made a financial product cool. And, I care about BTS and McDonald's. So um, I think that's that's actually uh, that's a really important point that you've made. Sure. Jason, I, I saw your hand. Um, if you still would like to make a comment, you're welcome to. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, Roderick, it's a great class. I've taught it uh, three times. And as I mentioned, I use in the second half of the course, we bring in, or actually, we it's kind of a video case uh, study format. I go ahead and interview the business owner or nonprofit director and uh, prepare that video ahead of time. But you mentioned that uh, you actually extended a case over more than one uh, semester, I think. And we're getting ready to do that. I've done 20 of the 21 of these agency projects over the last three years with different courses. Uh, all of them were student related courses. But what I'm really looking forward to just to share with you is that we, uh, the agency, the students who were in the cohort and performed a consumer behavior study proposal for the client, the client took that proposal with multiple research instruments and our suggestions on, we gave them some dummy data on how to report and track that. And that client's actually going to come back for an upper level course after implementing what the students suggested. And so we're really excited. I, some of the students are really looking forward to seeing whether the instruments actually yielded uh, some usable data because the course that they will now be doing is an agency project where they where they will propose a strategic plan based on the information that's gathered from the consumer behavior work. So just, uh, you know, it seems to work well and I'm, I'm encouraged uh, that it sounds like carrying it over, you know, from one course into another when possible, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do. I mean, students come and go and have different schedules, but it'll be neat if a couple of the students who were part of the original consumer behavior component We'll be able to help with the strategic planning later. But uh, anyway, great course. That's awesome. I, I really think that some of these 
some of the ways that are created that folks are talking about incorporating local businesses or agencies into the work they're doing in the classroom, like this is the example of making students feel like they're prepared on day one of their job. It's because they did the job while they were in school. So I, I love these examples. Yeah, a, a really cool one in the chat. I love that Tammy, she had, they have a director of diversity and inclusion um, at their university and, and they came and spoke to the, the multicultural case study. Uh, so not only involving local businesses, but the resources that you have available at your university, uh, getting them into the classroom to, to talk and expound on some of the things that are being taught. I think that that's, that's brilliant. I uh, haven't heard that one yet. So uh, we are actually out of time now, but uh, Radhika, that was, that was fantastic. I uh, love to, to I, this is the most interactive session I think I've ever been a part of for hosting at Sucant. We really like to keep tight grips, but it worked out okay. You guys are all professional, and so it worked out great. Thank you for everyone that contributed, and, and Radhika, thank you again for, for helping out. Of course. It was lovely to meet all of you guys. Thank you. Don't forget, we have more sessions coming up. So um, if you just go and check the agenda, you can launch into those sessions, and uh, we'll talk soon.